I, um, I feel really uh, pressed in my spirit as I was preparing uh, to speak into a certain issue today. And it is an issue that I believe we all at some time or other battle with. And it's the issue of anxiety. Anxiety. It, it is something that can grip your life. It is something that you can live with and you can just think, you know what, I'm just one of those type of people. I'm just one of those warriors. I'm just one of those anxious people. I'll never get away from it. I want to tell you there is freedom available from anxiety. And God is wanting to set people free. Strongholds, I believe, are going to be broken today in the name of Jesus because he is here to set captives free. On those of you who have been battling with anxious thoughts and things that can lead you into depression and into just a troubled, troubled mind, Jesus says, peace I leave you. Peace I give you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And that seems very easy to say. To say. And it's easy to, to read those scriptures that just say, don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything. And you think, well, that's all very well, but... But I want to bring you some keys today that I believe God is going to loose bonds and, and, and things, strongholds upon our lives to release us into freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And He came to set captives free. He came to open prison doors. He came to open blind eyes. And I believe that every time we meet together, if we're going to meet with the Lord, He's going to do something. He's the liberator. Okay, that wasn't even my introduction. Uh, just just to, to, to kick us off, I'm going to start us off with a really familiar scripture that you will know well from Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. It says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues. Who has got issues? I do not want you to tell lies in the house of God. It's not God, not good to appear on a Sunday morning and not tell you. We all have issues because, you know, we get saved and thank God for it. We get a new life. We get a relationship with God. We get our slate wiped clean. We get so much that, that is just amazing. We get the Holy Spirit with us. But we bring with us into our old life and into our new life a mind and a whole set of thinking that may not be quite there. We may, well, our thinking may still be stuck in where we came from, even though we've we arrived in somewhere new. Just as the children of Israel arrived in somewhere new, they arrived in the wilderness, they arrived out of Egypt, but their thinking was stuck in Egypt. And, and there, there can be things that there are in your heart that your heart is disposed towards certain things, you lean towards certain things, you're vulnerable towards certain things. Do you know what I'm talking about? You just, some people don't have a weakness in that area, but you know in your heart, I do. Uh, I'm, that's my area where I'm going to crumble. That's my area where I'm going to fall. I've got a vulnerability there. And, and some things that could be quite destructive and negative in your life. And we can have those things after we get saved. How do I know that? Because I got saved. And then I found that there's a whole mountain of all sorts of stuff that needs sorting out. And we need to know how to do that. And I just, before we get into talking specifically about the subject of anxiety, I want to just talk for a moment about the heart. Because, you know, your heart is a container. That's basically what it is. Jesus describes the heart as a field. He describes it as soil. He says when the sower sows the word into, the, in, into the, the field, he says, when he's explaining it, and he says the devil comes, the birds of the air come and snatch the seed away. He says the devil comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. Not many of you know your scriptures well enough. It comes and, and snatches away what was sown in their heart. Your heart is like soil that receives seed. And one of the things about your heart is that it will, like good soil, it will cause whatever is put in there to grow, to develop. It will nourish it. It will nurture it. And your heart doesn't care what it is. 
Your heart does not discern. You've got to be the one who discerns. You're the one who guides, who guards the gate to your heart. But once something's got in there, okay, your heart is going to cause it to grow. So if you allow the Word of God into your heart, and you say, I'm going to let that Word in, and, and you allow it, your heart is immediately going to take that Word, it's going to water it, it's going to tend it, it's going to nourish it, and the Word of God is going to grow in you. You're going to love that Word. Your heart is going to feed it. But if you allow pornographic images into your heart, guess what? Your heart is going to say, I'm sorry, I'm not having any of that stuff in here. No, your heart will just accept, if you've, if you've allowed it in, your heart will just accept that stuff, just like the Word of God, and say, okay, come on in. Let's water that. Let's feed those images. Let's nourish that. Let's cause that to grow inside your heart. That's how dangerous it is. That is what your heart is like. It does not discern, but it causes to flourish everything that you allow in there. No wonder the first thing that the Lord says is, God your heart, because out of it come all of the issues. And whatever you want to come out of your life, that's what you've got to put in to your heart. What would you like your life to be? What would you like your life to say? What would you like other people to say about you and your life? Those are the things that you need to be feeding your heart with. And you know, sometimes... What you put in is not the same as what you want to get out. Just go to the next slide if you would. You know if you, well, that says it all, doesn't it? If you want a sunflower, you don't plant sunflowers. You don't stick sunflowers in the soil. You plant seeds, things that look nothing like a sunflower, things that bear no resemblance to a sunflower, but it is the seed for what you want. And so we need to know what, what we want to come out of our life. If my, I want my life to be full of peace and joy and love, then, then I, I've got to know what the seeds are for those things. If I want prosperity to be a part of my life, I don't receive prosperity into my heart. I receive a spirit of giving and generosity into my heart. And I give, you know, prosperity may about, be about what we receive, but in order to, to, to get that, I need to give. I need to give out and give out and give out and cultivate a heart that is full of generosity and giving, that is open to do that. And guess what? That seed will produce a harvest. And if I want there to be joy in my life, there's no point in me pasting a big smile on my face and wander, wandering around all day. Like, ah, I'm a Christian. Because your joy is not a, a, a seed, joy is a harvest. But how do you get joy? Well, in the Bible it says that in His presence there is fullness of joy. So if I want to get joy, all I've got to do and all I've got to feed my heart with is His presence. Get into the presence of God. Spend time in His presence. Get time alone with Him. And you know what? Your life will be filled with joy. Because you got the seed, so you get the harvest. Some people, you know, have, have reckless hearts. Some of us have had a bit of a reckless heart, and we've got a field full of all sorts of stuff, mixed up, good and bad, and, and, and that can make for quite a chaotic life. Amen? Because the, the things that you chose to let, let into your heart at whatever stage are all, sooner or later, going to start come knocking at your door and start to make demands on you. Everything that you let into your heart will do that. So I, I, for example, I wanted a house. So I went and got a mortgage. And every month, that mortgage comes knocking at my door and, pay, and, and making a demand on my life. Every month without fail. Because I let that into my heart. That's how it, how it works. And, and I, I wanted children. So I, you know... I did what you do. And ever since, those children have come knocking at my door, making a demand. A demand on my time, a demand on my energy, and a demand on my wallet. Because whatever you choose to allow in is going to start making a demand on you. And you've got to be ready to deal with that. And if you have had a reckless heart and you've got a chaotic field full of things that you've let in on 
impulse, guess what? Those things are going to come knocking at your door. They're going to be calling your name, and they're going to be making demands on your life. And sometimes those could be conflicting demands because you've let all sorts of conflicting things in. So you men may give your heart to that beautiful lady, and you get married, and that's great, and you love it. But then those pornographic images that, that you let in a few years back start knocking at your door and calling your name. And you say, well, I don't, I don't want those there. I don't want that. I've got a beautiful wife who I love. But your heart says, well, I don't care about that. All I know is you gave me these a few years ago. And ever since, I've been tending them and nourishing them and making them grow. And here they are. You sent me a couple and now I've got a gallery. And because that same heart that loves your wife also loves You've got a battle on. So, guard. Guard your heart. Set some boundaries. Qualify what has access to your heart. What things? What people? I'm amazed at the number of people who don't set boundaries because it seems like disciplinary and old fashioned, and I don't need that. I'm free. And the Lord, you are free. But not everything is convenient. Not everything is going to do you good. Let's get talking about anxiety, okay? Anxiety is one of those things can manifest it in all sorts of ways. I, I've not been very well for the last uh, few weeks. And um, something you need to know about my household is they don't react very well to illness. <laughs> Sympathy is in short supply. Nancy just gets annoyed with me. She says, are you sick? I say, no, love. She says, you're sick. How long are you going to be sick for? You know, it's like I just said, I'm going on a fishing holiday for five days. No, I'm sick. So I felt that I needed to kind of play up the severity of what was going on. I said, I've had this for weeks, love. This is Aussie flu. This is not just flu. This is one of the most virulent strains of flu. Has anybody gone through that? Whoa, come on, you can get some sympathy. Pastor Paul, I know it, it really, it's long drawn out. And when you think one stage is finished, another stage start, kicks off. And it, it really is hard. I said, there's, there's been so much, um, the worst strain of flu for 50 years, love. 150 people have died <laughs> from flu-related diseases. Well, talk about a bad move. Nobody would come near me. They come to the door of my room with a handkerchief over the mouth and just push food under the door. Talk about anxiety. I'm over it now. I can see some of you getting handkerchiefs out of yourself. I think you still got it. It could be contagious. Anxiety is when you anticipate the worst case scenario. When you play over in your mind, you want, your mind starts to play out. What's the worst thing that can happen? Because that's probably what's going to happen to me. It's the opposite of hope. Hope is the anticipation of the best that can happen, the best that God has for you. So, so some people, okay, situation, the boss walks into your office, you think, oh no. It's the first thing that comes into your head, oh no. I knew this was coming, this is bad news. Another person, same boss, walks into the same office, they think, yes, this is my promotion day. I knew this was coming. I mean, this is my pay rise. It's coming up. I can feel it. Nothing's happened yet, except the boss has walked into the office, but it has in your mind. Now, I don't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands to say which one would you be, but I would bet my bottom dollar that there'd be a lot more anxious ones than there would be hopeful ones. 
Because there is an enemy in your life who wants to frustrate you and wants to, to, to labor, you, lay you down with anxieties and stresses and all sorts of things that are made up of the future that hasn't happened yet. But he's telling you about all these things that you can worry about and you can fret about and you can get anxious about and you can get depressed about and you can go to the doctors for pills about. And before you know it, you're absolutely living a non-abundant life. And it makes me angry. Because God said he came to set his people free. And there is a freedom available to everybody from anxiety. I know Paul says don't be anxious. I know Jesus says don't be anxious about anything. Just, just, you see those scriptures there. But you can be saved and anxious. Okay? And I don't want you to think of yourself as some kind of second-class citizen, and that's something that you can't confess. Oh, I don't let anybody know the way that I'm thinking and the way that I'm feeling. No, we need to share with one another. We need to be real. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be honest and say, yeah, I can be anxious. Many of you will, will, will know the story of how Nancy and I met, but if, if that's new to you, let me try and sum it up in about 30 seconds, okay? Uh, she lived in Canada. She had a dream three nights in a row and through a series of completely supernatural, miraculous events, God told her to come to Manchester where she would meet me and that I was going to be a husband. Okay? That's a snippet. My side, the same time God had spoken to me here in Manchester that I was going to be married and said some very specific things uh, about that and that I needed to get myself ready for the woman that... God was going to send into my life. So Nancy visited the place where I lived uh, with a family, and God, God told me, she's the one. She's the one. Uh, so without me knowing anything about why she'd come, about her background, um, I just told her that I believed that God had sent her, and, and you know, she was the one, and what do you say? And when I think about it, I kind of start to tremble a bit. Uh, and I don't know how it is that God can give you a boldness that is not you. But I know that when it's necessary, see, I'm a cautious person. If you know me, you'll know that I take my time. I am not going to, I'm not impulsive. I'm not going to go straight into some life changes decision without thinking about it. I'm not. I'm going to pray about it. And when I've prayed about it enough, I think, okay, God, I think this is you, but I would need a confirmation. Please give me a confirmation, God. And when I've got my confirmation, I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, so much for that confirmation. I just need you to confirm that that confirmation was you. And then I think I'll be all right to just edge your head a little bit. That's the kind of person I am. But you know, God is able to take you. And I don't know what was going on in heaven, but I know there was a timetable, and I was not keeping to timetable. I was way, way behind in this. Now, Nancy you knew why she was coming to, to Manchester, but I, the penny only dropped with me. Uh, when, when God just kind of opened my eyes all of a sudden, and it was as if God said, I don't know, Gabriel, Michael, you guys, you're going to have to get down there. You're going to have to do something with this guy. You're going to have to kick this boy into touch because he does not get it. He's not in the ballpark, and something is going to have to happen, and it's going to have to happen today. Okay, okay, boss, we'll do it. And something happened to me that I had that boldness to, to, to be able to ask a, a woman that I'd barely met, didn't know at all, to marry me because I had the confidence that it was God. Absolute, absolute, unswaying confidence. I knew that I knew that I knew in my spirit. No problem at all. And then when I'd asked her, she says, well, let me tell you my story. And then it was more confirmation and more um, amazing uh, assurance of God's Word. But then she went back to Canada because it was just a holiday. And, you know, she had to go back. So we, we had to start a, an email relationship with a phone call thrown in here and there. But you know, the day after she went back, I woke up with all of that knowledge of what God had told me, absolute assurance, and I woke up and my whole being was saying to me, what has he done? <laughs> what 
Is he crazy? He has lost his mind. He's just given his whole life away to a woman that he doesn't know. And what is going to happen about this? And what is going to happen about that? And how is that going to get sorted out? And what the heck? And, and before I knew it, anxiety had absolutely gripped me. You know, you can be like a split personality. The Bible talks about the spiritual man and the natural man. The natural man does not know the things of God, does not receive the things of God, does not understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. In my spirit, I knew, never doubted it once. Not for a second did I doubt that God was in it and that God had brought it all together. A miracle, supernatural, God from beginning to end. But the rest of me was panicking. How is that going to work out? How is this going to work out? Yeah, but, but where, where are we going to live? And I don't earn money. I'm just working voluntarily. How am I going to provide for my household? And what about the kids? And what about that? And what about where we're going? And it just began all day and all night. And it was, I, I lost weight. People say I've not got much on me to start with. All right, okay. I've always been the skinny one. But I lost weight. Probably had more on me, actually, at the time. And I really it dropped off me. Dropped off me because of anxiety. I fretted and I, oh my God. And I know the Bible says don't be anxious. I know all that. It doesn't help. Because what you need is a word. Let's just look at a scripture for a moment. Uh, in fact, before we go to the next slide, let me just tell you that um, how God solved it for me. God said to me one day, because I was praying, and I needed a word. Now, I'll tell you what, go to that uh, Philippians 4 scripture for me, please. Don't be anxious about anything. There you go. Simple. Just get on with it. Don't be anxious, okay? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. That the what he's saying there is that there is nothing in your life that is worth getting anxious about. Nothing is worth you devoting the energy and the, the thought time to being anxious about. But everything is worth praying about. Nothing's worth being anxious about, but everything is worth praying about. Now you think, you, you, some of you are finding this hard already because you, th you think, well, should I not be anxious if I get a bad report from the doctors? Should I not be anxious if my kids are getting bullied at school? Should I not get anxious if suddenly I lose my job? Well, the Bible says no, you shouldn't. You don't even ever take it down the beginning of that route. You immediately, you pray about it. As soon as you're tempted to be anxious, which is mulling it around in your head and saying, I wonder what is going to happen, oh dear, 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 dear. Then immediately you start to pray about it. And, and that, that is the first key. Nothing is worth getting anxious about. Everything is worth praying about. But then he says, by prayer and supplication. Just highlight that there. Well, what is supplication? What's that? It's a type of prayer, but, but, but what's it? Supplication is, it's praying until. Supplication is praying and praying and not letting go. It's a determined prayer. It's a prayer that won't give up. It's a prayer that says, I need an answer, God. It was my prayer in that moment where I said, oh God, I can't live this way. I can't live with this anxiety. I, can't. I need an answer from you, God. And I prayed, and I kept on praying, and I laid hold of God, and it was as if in my spirit I said, I'm not getting up from here until I've got my answer. I need my word. You need a word, and you need to know how to lay hold of God for a word that will give you the assurance that you need. Because there, there is a word, and there is a word. There's a word that says, don't be anxious. And to be honest, let me be, let's be, be completely frank about it. That was a completely useless word to me. It's in the Bible. It's part of the Word of God. But it did not help me one jot. No use to me at all. But there is such a thing as what the Bible calls the engrafted word. Receive, Peter says, with, with 
is it James? I can't remember. Receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your soul. What's an engrafted word? It's something that gets grafted onto you. Like a, when you're doing, those of you who do gardening, uh, not like me, you, 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 you'll know all about grafting a, a, a shoot or, or, or um, a, a branch of, of something onto the root of another plant and it grafts on and it becomes a part of that plant. It actually t- it becomes stuck onto it. Now that's what you get with the word. The, when the word becomes a part of you, when, when you get a word that, that, that uh, gives you so much assurance, it gets stuck to you. You can't, you can't get rid of it. You can't it's got a hold of you. You've not got a hold of it anymore. It's just got a hold of you. That's the engrafted word. That's able to save your soul. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I said, God, I need a word. And God didn't give me a word. And it was to, to begin with another of those words that seemed unhelpful when Jesus is talking about don't be anxious for tomorrow. Take no thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink. All of the things that I was doing, you know, uh, for the future, for tomorrow. Take no thought for tomorrow. And I said, God, but th- that's exactly my problem. And the Lord said to me this. He said, there's a reason why I put that in the Word. He says, you are looking at tomorrow's problems from today's perspective. And when you see tomorrow from today, all you're going to see is tomorrow's problems. You're never going to see tomorrow's solution because I have tomorrow under lock and key. I'm not going to open it up to you right now. It's, it's not available to you right now. I can't tell you the grace and the answers and the solutions and the miracles that I've got up in store because I is not seen. An ear is not heard and it hasn't entered into your heart yet. The things that I've prepared for you because I love you. But he, he said, you are looking at tomorrow's problem from today. And you will never see. Because when tomorrow comes, I'll unlock tomorrow. And I will unlock tomorrow's grace. And I will unlock tomorrow's solution. And I will unlock tomorrow's miracle. And you will see what I will do. And it will be a testimony. And it will just be one of those things where you say, I had no solution. I had no peace. I had no idea. But God, but God, but God came in and brought the answer to me. Hallelujah. And you know, when I, when I saw that, and God said to me, just don't go there. Don't look at tomorrow. Because you're only going to see the problem, and that's going to just get you at it. Tomorrow will look after itself. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You just concentrate on on today and look at the blessings. Look at what I've unlocked for you today. And do you know it did it for me? That was the word. That was all I needed to hear. I said, God, I'm going to take my hands off it. I have no idea, no more idea than I had five minutes ago what the answers are going to be. The problem is just as difficult. Things are just as impossible. Things are just as as hopeless. But tomorrow, you're going to unlock the key. And trust took over. And hope took over. With supplication... Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Third key, with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. Why with thanksgiving? There's uh, uh, often uh, not a lot that you can feel thankful about when you're anxious, is there? Because your whole mind seems to be full of things that you are not thankful about and you wish weren't there. But let me illustrate it this way. If somebody was to bring me a bunch of keys at the end of this service, and they turned out to be my keys, I would say, oh, thank you very much, those are mine. But if somebody brought me a bunch of keys at the end of the service, and they weren't mine, I wouldn't say, oh, thank you very much, because they're not mine. I'd say, okay, don't know who they, they are. Let, let's leave them uh, for a bit, take them to Graham and Margaret. They'll look after them, and, and that's that. I'm not, I'm not going to thank you. For, for the keys because they, they aren't mine. But if they're mine, I'm going to thank you. What am I saying? You, you, you thank God for what you know is yours. You, you thank God for 
um, something that you know belongs to you. It's your portion. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving means that I approach God believing that what I know belongs to me because he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. I know that belongs to me. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start thanking him for it. I may not feel it, but I'm going to start thanking him for it. I thank you, God, that you are going to crush Satan under my feet. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. I'm going to thank you, God, that no weapon that is formed against me is going to prosper. I'm going to thank you, God, that though a thousand should fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, it shall not come near me. I'm going to thank you, God, that you always lead me into victory. You always cause me to triumph in Christ. I thank you that your peace Peace is going to rule in my heart. I may be feeling anxious, but I'm going to declare your word. And I'm going to thank you because what you're giving me belongs to me. It's my portion. It's mine. And I am having it. Thank you very much. You said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. So I claim it. With thanksgiving. And that changes the tone of your prayer. Prayer supplication, pray through with thanksgiving. Don't be anxious about anything, but by means of prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God and the peace of God, which passes, transcends all understanding. There's your result. There's your harvest. You sowed the seed. You're going to get your harvest. Some of you are going to get a harvest today. Some of you are going to get released today. Some of you have been anxious all of your life. You've never known anything else, but there's that quiet, a dull anxiety. It's like a dull headache in your life. It never goes away, and you think, well, I'm just one of those type of people. I know you are not. And today you are going to experience that you're not because God is going to set you free. There's liberty from anxiety here, I believe, in this room this morning. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Look at what the peace does. It guards. What did we start off with? The the, the, the word in Proverbs that said, guard your heart. You guard it. But now God is saying, if you will do these things, if you will pray, if you will trust in me, if you will pray through, if you'll have thanksgiving in your heart, I'm going to send peace into your heart. And not only that, that word guard, it actually means a garrison, like a garrison of soldiers. And God is saying, I'm going to send, marching into your life, I'm going to send a garrison of soldiers who are going to stand guard to the left, to the right, behind, in front, above, beneath. They're going to stand guard over your heart so that the peace of God will never, ever leave it. The peace of God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God told you to do it in Proverbs. Now he says his peace will do it for you. Okay, I'm closing. Worship team, come and join me. If you can take this, if you can receive this, and this is not just a milk that's a a sweet tasting word. This is a meat that you've got to go away and chew and take away and put into action But for some of you, I believe and I know that this signals the end of fear dominating your life. It signals the end of depression. And I'm declaring that over you today. Depression is going to find an end today. Anxiety is going to find an end today. Anxious thoughts are not going to be a part of your life anymore because God is the liberator. He is the one who opens the prison doors. He's the one who set the captive free. He's the one who opens blind eyes. And I believe there's been an opening of blind eyes today. You're going to say goodbye to to the depression and the insecurity. You're going to say goodbye to have that, to, to, to that knot that's constantly in your stomach turning around getting you worried about this and that. God's going to break it off this morning. Let's stand to our feet. You don't have to live that way any longer. The Word of God is saying to you this morning, you don't have to live that way any longer. I am declaring freedom over you. 
and you need to receive it, you know, please do not be one of those people who says, no, not me. Then No, this is for you today. This is for you. Don't, there's no shame in it. I've shared myself how anxious I was, how I battled, and I know how much you've battled. But God is going to set you free today. You came here anxious, but, but, but you're going to walk away free. And you don't have to live that way. You go for your breakthrough today. And I want you to, to start to raise your voice. I want you to start to lift your voice up to God and say, God, I'm going to claim my victory today. Freedom from anxiety is mine today. I'm not going to be ruled by anxious thoughts. I'm not going to let the enemy who seeks to kill and to destroy, I'm not going to let him have what does not belong to him because there is something that belongs to me called the peace of God and it is going to rule in my heart. And I'm going to experience that freedom in Jesus' name. I receive it now, Lord. I receive your freedom. I receive. It's coming to me now. Peace that money cannot buy. Peace that the world cannot give. I'm no longer a slave to fear. But I am a child of God. And I'm going to walk in the liberty of the child of God. Receive it. Receive the blessing of God. It's yours for, for you today in Jesus' name.